When people ask me why they can't do certain things, I say, replace why with what for. Who is the master of the household? A man often resembles a helium balloon striving to reach for the sky. A woman is like a string that keeps the balloon in place. Contemporary society is male-dominated. Vision boards. Many people get too absorbed in this. That's how I see it. They get too absorbed and go straight into the material world. You need to refocus on yourself and learn to respect yourself. Today, I would like to touch some very important issues. We'll let the conversation flow naturally while discussing this or that topic. I want to talk about family, relations between a man and a woman, joint creativity. Imram and Khadija's family is a perfect example for me. Like many other families that are creative and sincere, I think such families can show the path to truth to many of us. If the space and master allow, I would like to talk a little about children. They are our future. And for me, this subject is very topical, too. They are our legacy. I think we cannot regard children merely as our extension. Some may project it onto their current job. Every one of you does a very important job and brings the outcome to this world. I think it's very important. I'd like to discuss a topic that has become very fashionable nowadays. Whether it is good or bad for us, today we'll make it out. I'd like to talk about awareness, basic perceptions. What are they? Here is today's agenda. How it will go, I'll leave it to chance. The interesting thing about spontaneity is that it always brings new experiences that are not generated to catch you off balance. Nobody in this life, nor the Creator Himself, will ever come upon their child or their disciple following the path, and all of us are disciples, unawares or unprepared. No disciple is ever given a task they won't be able to cope with. If once we are taken by surprise, it means we are fully prepared for this experience. We need to learn to trust. There are many fashionable affirmations now, like the universe loves me, or I trust the universe, and so on. It must be more than just words. One should live it, feel it. Just make up your mind at some point that you are open to it. Moreover, the more you open up, the more opportunities are given to you. When people ask me why they can't do certain things, and many other whys, I say replace why with what for. What are you unable to do these things for? What is this happening to you for? What is all this for? A person starts to think about it. All spontaneous realizations are related to our absolute creativity. This is how I create music. I never write sheet music or something like that. I just play spontaneously as there are always new states. Our lives are like music. I had the last question about relationships that has just popped up now that you said this. Who is the master of the household? God. God. God is the master of the household. He created this situation. It's up to him to deal with it. Just kidding. I feel it this way. Of course, in social terms, the husband is responsible for his wife whether he wants it or not. A man has taken responsibility, even if he doesn't like it, even if he thinks it's all wrong and he has made a mistake. He has already accepted this responsibility, so he has to lead the woman all the way through, and it doesn't matter what he thinks about it. Whether he wants it or not, he is in charge. This is because he is a creative triangle pointing upwards. 
His woman, or Shakti, is a triangle pointing downwards. A triangle pointing downwards doesn't mean she is inferior, it means that by receiving this divinity, a woman transmits it into our life and changes this space. Because a woman, or a girl, or Shakti, is the guardian of the divine fire or creativity. You asked about the master of the household. What does it mean to be the master? It's the one who can do everything without others' help. He's always like that. Here we can't say that one is the master. They are equal. They just know, and that's that. This is how I see it. People can find themselves in different situations. Sometimes they break up. I know that you also talk about it. How not to blame yourself if you couldn't keep the family together. And another related question. We can witness a sort of imbalance in the contemporary world. Women are high achievers, they earn good money. How to keep everything balanced? How to develop the right attitude? How to remain respectful and not to feel guilty if the marriage failed? Many people come to me and ask questions. When they ask me, give us your blessing that we may divorce, I never do that. I do my best to explain everything to the person who seeks help, be it a man or a woman. I say, bring your spouse here and we'll discuss it together. There were cases like that. Or I just say, if divorce makes you feel guilty, it's your karma, and you will have to repay this karmic debt in the next life. With the same person? Probably. Or it might be a similar situation. Often the person will be the same, although cases may vary. We've already witnessed many such situations. I ask a straightforward question, do you need it? They say no. Wouldn't it be easier to settle the matter here and now, rather than fall into the same trap in the next life? What is the purpose of life? They go, realization. Okay, what do you mean by realization? I look at them and I see that their realization is like, I have everything, I don't build any commitment with anyone. I feel perfectly fine, and I don't want to do anything. That's their realization. There is the phenomenon of a false realm of spiritual perception. Realization is actually a state in which a person is fully committed to the divine principle that is within each of us. This is a service. Realization is not about withdrawing from life, but about staying in the world. But if a person can't tackle their family issues, how can they settle questions related to the family of the entire universe to a particular society? They form part of it. And I have to explain that if divorcing people feel guilty, it means that the issue is not settled yet. And it will continue to hang like a sort of Damocles over their heads. A couple must solve all their issues. They can divorce only when. Some of them ask me, for example, what should I do now? I always say that a couple can divorce when they love each other and have no grudges against each other, when they are completely at peace as friends. Then they'll see if they can divorce and whether it's worthwhile. There are many cases like that, and I think here is the reason. Contemporary society is male-dominated. It's obvious. People's left brain is always active, and a woman has to, or rather is forced to, as it's not her natural choice. She is forced to switch to masculine energies. It's the source of confusion. A woman thinks she wants to be strong. She understands it and feels that she has that power within her. How should she evaluate it? It's rather hard for a woman because the right brain doesn't deal with the nitty-gritty. 
So she deludes herself and starts taking advantage of what men use. That is, she switches to masculine energies. The most destructive power for a woman's energy is competition. For a woman, to compete means to destroy herself, to destroy her feminine energy of Shakti. A man's world is a world of competition. A woman can realize her potential professionally or in creative pursuits, as well as through hobbies. But there are nuances. There are a lot of nuances that need to be understood, recognized, accepted, and taken into account so that the things that a woman is doing nurture her, give her power, and make her stronger. At this point, it is her feminine potential that she is nurturing. She becomes stronger. But this strength is very different from that of a man. We are perfectly aware of it because with a single glance, a woman can practically trigger a world war. One must come to the realization of what it is. And I am sure that from that time on, a woman's life will become totally different. I think there will be fewer unhappy women. It's the most important thing. Of course, there are a lot of nuances. But women switching to masculine energies seems a very relevant issue now. Are there any tools I absolutely agree with you. I also feel it. Over past several years, I have met a lot of people who are greatly concerned about women trying too hard to prove something, while wishing to connect to their true nature, including me to this or that extent. We always grow and want to attain a deeper knowledge about these things. And I don't understand how to preserve a woman's nature in today's world. Because sometimes all the circumstances are such that we express ourselves somehow, and we use, I use, men's tools, which makes me lose myself. Unfortunately, our society will always force a woman to shift to these energies. Of course, there is an option of going away, secluding oneself in order to nurture this strength through practice. The magnetism, feminine magnetism, will start growing. And then there comes a moment when you no longer fear to go there. It's even less fearful when you have a man by your side to play this role. He will solve all these issues for you. Then you can go. But my dream is, at least I do something to achieve this. I want to teach and refocus people step by step, maybe through my personal example. I am still studying this question. I keep finding more and more new information. This is our karmic path, our mission, to help people through our own example. Some of you could find another way. I want to help people understand the advantages of such unions where each has their role. It can be the way to find happiness, female happiness. I can't put it into words, it's inside, it's so warm, so pervasive, endless, and utterly impossible to explain verbally. And this is power, for I know how it works. Specifically in the union? Specifically in the union. I carry out my role and I know when I am resourceful, harmonious, accepting. In that special state, I feel how the world changes around me. I noticed it long ago when we had no knowledge and no understanding. I'm sorry to go so long, but it's very important. 
After I had a baby, my husband said that I shouldn't work. I tried. I wanted to help to find a job. But here my karma came into play, and every time I found a job, either the company shut down or I had to leave. I have a degree in medicine. I tried to work in this field. He said, stay home, I'll provide for the family. I wasn't used to it, but I gave up. Of course, my child had a lot of my attention. It's natural. And I noticed that my state of mind was translated directly by my family, especially the child. My spouse as an adult can restrain his emotions, feelings, hold himself together when needed, and so on. However, the child reflects everything immediately. Come on, I say to myself, hold yourself together, lady, and you start working on yourself. The child seemed a wholly different person, this is certain. I grabbed onto this and started to explore the issue further and deeper. Later, I started spotting this in my extended family, among my brothers, sisters, parents, and my husband. For example, some problem comes up which has to be solved. I start to panic. Then I say to myself, take it easy. Then I notice that my husband is also getting better at controlling himself. Of course, he is naturally strong. But I am aware of the role I play here. Basically, it takes takes one to be an observer, a simple observation without theatrics, without any philosophical conclusions, just being an observer, and you'll see everything. Have you noticed that in this world we are not allowed to be observers? We have to move fast all the time. We simply miss everything, and we, attention. Yes, attention dissipates into thin air. When we started to practice Kriya, when it became our personal practice, we started to understand and achieve things many times faster. We live in a very interesting period where your thoughts may materialize really quickly. It is therefore very important to shape your life. Speaking about outer beauty, there are a lot of beautiful people, all are beautiful. But the outer beauty must be backed by a powerful inner spiritual foundation. Inner beauty is a translation of outer beauty. The entire world is designed so that our mind rampantly drains energy through the five senses to the surrounding space through identification with this world. And we greatly depend on the outside world in our attempts to make our lives more beautiful. It turns out that we are losing our strength and feminine magnetism. Women ask me, how can I attract a genuine person, a real man? How can you attract him? How can you attract a man if your feminine magnetism goes away, dissipates, and gets lost in the endless number of life concepts? You need to refocus on yourself and learn to respect yourself. When a woman, a girl, Shakti, says that she is dependent on circumstances, that she can't do certain things and so on and so forth, she takes a step down. And then a thought pops up into her head. I'm already 35 and I'm not married yet. 36 is looming. What's going to happen? I don't have much time left. This is even worse. She needs to raise her standard and treat herself as the goddess, as Shakti. It's a trendy thing to talk about, but these words often stay just words. But if you shape the concept of being the goddess in your mind, you should develop the qualities of the goddess. For example, read the book The Great Female Yogis of Tibet. It describes how ordinary villagers became realized saints and attained complete liberation. These were ordinary women who did not possess the knowledge or intelligence available to our contemporaries. They attained complete liberation only because they visualized their lives in meditation. They visualized themselves in meditation. They recreated themselves. What is the principle that helps us achieve our lofty, noble goals, even be it in the horizontal plane of our society? 
It implies continuous awareness of your needs. The life goal that you set will determine your actions. Energy flows where attention goes. If you have little energy, it will be hard for you to act. So you need to awaken this power. We do it in meditation. What is meditation? This is an idea, auto-suggestion and perception of the outcome. It's a very general explanation. This is concentration on a certain idea. It's powerful auto-suggestion when you are thankful for everything that happens to your body and your consciousness, including the body of life. Our life is our body. Our body is also life. But the life in which you are residing is your body. It is being shaped here and here. When this concentrates properly and this enjoys, things happen very quickly. You need to learn to shape your life. You need to learn auto-suggestion. What is auto-suggestion? You start to physically feel how something happens. It makes you burst with happiness and gives you shivers. You are shaking with excitement, as if it has already happened. You need to lead your emotional plane to this level. Then perception will happen immediately. Everything happens very quickly. That's the basis of yoga. On the other hand, people have many illusions. They waste their whole lives trying to buy the coolest fridge ever. And when the fridge is there, it brings no joy. Because they must fill it with food, but they have no more money nor energy left. Figuratively speaking. Consequently, you need to develop the right attitude and set the right goal. What is the purpose of life? I always ask, what do we live for? People keep asking, how do you make life good? What is your goal? If you don't have a goal, life will not be good, because all your energy will be dissipated. If there is a single idea, we are driven towards it, and it mystically attracts everything we need. When a person has a desire to earn, say, a billion, they say, I want to earn a billion, and then I'll start practicing yoga. I ask, what do you need this money for? They go, I'll think about it later. The universe won't give them that money. I had a friend, Kamal. He says, money first, then I'll take care of everything and help you. I answer, I don't need your help, all my wealth is with him. He is still trying to earn it. It's been 10 years now, but even that's not the point. The fact is, the universe gives it to you. Well, sometimes it hits you. It gives it to you only when you know what you are going to do with that money, what you are going to do with that beauty, what you need it for. What will you do with your husband when you have one? What will you give to your child who is due? They are anxious to get it, and sometimes I ask about it, for example. A woman who just instinctively wants to have a child, but she doesn't know what she is going to give them. Once I met a very arrogant girl, she came to yoga, to a seminar, and said, my child will be the smartest, my child will be the most well-off, my child. She has already lined up a life for him. I tell her, please stop, don't do that. She replies, no, I see what kids are like now. I've already prepared everything for him. He will be the smartest, the coolest, the most intelligent, the most developed. I implored her not to do that. What do you think happened in the end? A year and a half or two years later, I don't remember how much time it passed, she came in with tears in her eyes. Her child was born with Down syndrome. She goes, what should I do? I want to place him in an institution. She decided to abandon her child. Can you imagine what happened to this person? I said, I warned you not to do that. Yes, I remember, but now, what do I do now? I can't live with a child like that. He will only interfere. And I came down upon her. It's absolutely not your case. You are different. Your consciousness is different. I feel it. I see that each of you not only has a mind, but the heart and the soul as well. If you want to gain control of emotions, you need to awaken your consciousness and immerse it in your heart. Everyone should do that. Emotions are a good thing, yet they should be positive. They should be positive. They should be positive. Can you tell us more about immersing emotions in the heart? 
We have limitless opportunities. When you dream about achieving something, you don't always understand how to make it come true, but you are eager to get it. When you want, it's your emotions, the astral plane, a person desires, but first, they have an idea. Say they have an idea of a well-off family or prosperity. It's the right thing for a girl. For a woman, this is very important. A woman is not exactly material, but she lives in this matter. And she transforms this matter. A man often resembles a helium balloon, striving to reach for the sky. A woman is like a string that keeps the balloon in place. Stay here. This space offers endless opportunities to those who have understood how to interact with this space. For a girl, interaction with this space means a clear understanding of what she wants, plus positive energies. I'm now going to disclose the formula for achievement. It's a magic wand that is way cooler than Harry Potter's. The clarity of purpose, plus positive energies. You need to learn by translating, by understanding what you want. To channel it through the feelings of joy and bliss in the present, as if it has already happened. This positive component is your emotions. You are happy that something has happened. Imagine that you have no spouse, no children, no money, no opportunities, nothing you dream of. Sit down and start deluding yourself, saying, how lucky I am to have such a spouse, how lucky I am to have such a child, to have everything. After a while, let's say a few days, a week or two, depending on how long your wish list is, you start realizing that you are really carried away by the process. It's not about telling lies to yourself. It doesn't matter to your mind whether you have a husband or not. If you think about him, you have him. Plus, there is a notion. Is it all right to speak about husbands? Super. Yes, a good topic. Maybe you'll marry again. Sometimes it happens. By the way, I wanted to raise this question too. Again, your mind doesn't care. It captures everything you visualize and think about, whether you run or not, whether you squat or not. That's why I said idea, imagination, sensation at the beginning. You need to learn to envision, to imagine, to sense, and everything will happen to you. But these sensations must be only positive. After enjoying in the present moment what has already happened for a week or two, you will feel that your power has increased. Here's how it works. You feel that the space begins to interact with you in some way and that it's happening. It's happening right now. Always be grateful. Every time it happens, be grateful for it. Because materialization of any opportunities offered by this quantum limitless space occurs when you begin to penetrate into this space with your consciousness and shape the necessary idea in this space. Then it starts to deliver that idea in the desired form. If you are fearful of something and visualize it, it will happen sooner or later. If you shape positive ideas, they will materialize. Vision boards have become fashionable now, and many people get too absorbed in it. This is my opinion. They get too absorbed and go straight into the material world. Yes. Maybe it's also sincere on their part. And I see that they might think something like, I'm going to get plenty of money now. But they are sincere in their desire, and they get it. How does it work? The information field is full of such requests. That's right. It's a kind of distortion. I don't know what it is. It's a drawback. I was about to mention a very important aspect. Here we have a very important detail. When we ask for something material, our mind must be set on heaven. 
Because the meditative state we are in at this moment, in fact, what we are doing, is meditation on a subject, on an achievement. For me, meditation is about communicating with the Creator. By and large, He has every advantage for us, He has every opportunity. If we want something in particular, say a yellow Zaporozhets with a particular license plate, I want it, it's a vintage car. I want neither Mercedes nor any other car make, I want a yellow Zaporozhets, that's all. When you want something in particular, you need to learn to turn your mind to where it is possible, from where it all emerges. If we cannot directly connect to our limitless universal mind, that enables us to realize our capabilities, it will be very hard for us to do so. This is a very serious concept or technology that we were deprived of in today's world. Because the Western mind, it's a concept. There is the Eastern mind that is focused in our inner environment and the Western mind. Not that the West is bad, but here we have two poles, left and right hemispheres, and it doesn't take these things into account. It wants everything right now. This is what many psychologists did, they just cut off the spiritual component. They developed technologies for dissection of the brain, our mental plane, and nothing more. And it doesn't work. Many psychologists come to see me after a while because they have problems. It's their karma. When a person offers a piece of advice, they are held accountable for it. Therefore, a person who is constantly working with others, sharing knowledge, must understand that their potential must be very, very high in the spirit. Then they will be able to act as the comforter. When you come to see saints or masters, why are people attracted to saints? I had a first-hand experience back in the years when I would meet saints. Remember Jonah, an old man in Odessa? Multitudes of people go to him, they don't know why. Everyone comes to find happiness, but few of these people understand what this happiness is. Here is a very simple example. It happened to one Kriya Yoga master that we know. A girl came to him. Her family in India, near Delhi, kicked her out of the house. Not much time had passed since. And she said, either I kill myself or you give me your blessing that I may have a child because I can't have children within the family. In India, they are very strict about it. If her husband kicks her out, nobody will ever marry her. Plus, there exists an enclave for them where they live like nuns and wear white clothes. The conditions are harsh there. It's their tradition for some reason. And he says, yes, your karma is heavy, but I can bless you and you will have a child. But for this, you need to meditate for three hours for several years. She replies, I will do anything if it brings me a child. Good. For three years, she meditated on light and sound, three hours in the morning and three hours in the evening. This is a Kriya Yoga element. After these three years, she came back to him. He said, very good, you did what I told you, but your karma is still rather heavy. You need to have six to eight hours of daily practice for five more years. She had no choice. Five years later, she came back, her task accomplished. He says to practice for three more years, 12 hours daily. Good. She left him. She was a young girl. There was enough time for her. After these three years, she came back to him, he looked at her and said, done. You did a great job, you resolved your karma. You'll have a child, I'll give you this opportunity. But for this, give me whatever you have gained in meditation. She dropped to her knees, burst into tears, and begged him. I need neither husband nor child, nothing, just don't take away what I have gained in meditation. She found absolute happiness there, absolute peace, joy, power. Meditation made her strong and she didn't need anybody else. If we create a family with this aspect in mind, everything will go well. We should feel and understand that this is the Creator who gives us this limitless love, a child, a husband, a bad husband or a bad wife. This is also a component of love, whatever we need. If you approach it this way, you'll have absolutely no problems. There is a good formula that has always helped me. The gazillion things in this world are not worth worrying about.
If we have confidence in the universal space, by and large, Okay, let's look at it this way. Why do we need a good family? Why do you need a good family? Why do you need children? To enjoy life and be happy. But if you find happiness in meditation, so endless, that nothing can compare to it, and then you are asked about whether you want, you will say that you don't want. I don't mean it's not necessary. I just want you to understand that there are states in which everything we dream about has existed for a very long time already. We just need to get it right. From the vision board, yes. Vision boards that we put up for our subconscious mind to... It is a passive practice that takes a very long time. We could literally achieve our goals in a month if we wanted to. Certain people are very resident. They easily couple opportunities and time. It's their karma. They can just click and immediately get an opportunity. But they don't know what to do with it. Sometimes they are taken aback so much that they exclaim, no, no, it can't be true. The universe reacts, well, they don't believe. Okay, next, please. Yes, this ship has sailed. People often ask the following question about relations. Maybe you, as a man and as a woman, will show us different perspectives. Absolutely. One cannot spend 24 hours in a day, even if they wanted to. I wanted so much, Murad, only admiring their partner, respecting them, being grateful to them. I wanted so much, but it wasn't me who asked it. Sometimes a person can... Again, it's not me who asks it. Sometimes a person can trigger negative emotions. We are only human. Yes. How should one feel about this? How not to go to extremes? You've already mentioned that we live in a consumer society, in an information-oriented society. Many young people easily find another partner if they couldn't keep their previous relationship. How not to perceive these states? How to perceive these states correctly? How should one feel about it? None of us are saints. We strive for it, but we are not saints and we feel different things. Anger, resentment, annoyance, or something else. Love. Now it's easier for me to answer this question. Because earlier I was very emotional, to put it mildly. I was too emotional. I guess that's okay. It's not bad, but the thing is, these emotions destroy you. It doesn't feel right. You cannot see the limit. You give in to your emotions, and in the end you realize that you are exhausted. Of course, there was always a question, what do I do now? What to expect? Perhaps the universe so responded that I got the opportunity to work using the right scientific approach. I find it easier now because I know what to do when emotions are running high. I just know what to do. I have this practice. I don't know if we can reveal the secrets of our practice now. Sure, yes. Actually, the core of that tradition is, there are, of course, a lot of techniques that then lead up to that. The basic principle is that energy flows where attention goes. We learn to focus our attention on the divine cave. That's what we call it. You can call it something else, whatever you like. The divine cave is at the center of our physical body. This is our brain, medulla oblongata, and the entire length of the spine. Once you have mastered concentration, you'll have the habit of immersing your mind in the spine with every burst of emotion. That emotion will dissolve there. From then on, it stops destroying you.
Now, it happens very quickly. One must train, of course. You train, but you get exponential results. You put certain effort into it. Why exponential growth? Because this is how our nature works. As a medical professional, I think that a human body, and I'm sure that no one doubts it, our body is unique and built. How not to believe? I remember when we were students, we studied human tissues under a microscope. I was so amazed. They are so perfect, so beautiful. Everything is so balanced and harmonious. Back then I thought that doctors must be the greatest believers. This is how I saw it. How is it possible not to believe in the Creator who created it? Then I got a little disappointed. Our tissues, our body has an enormous number of mechanisms for self-cleaning and self-healing at the physical level. Each type of tissue, be it heart tissue or muscle tissue or any other, is continuously replicating, regenerating, restoring. If a tissue can't do it, it means that destructive processes are dominant in that body. The body does not have time to recover because the destructive process is very active. The same mechanisms work at the emotional level. Purification is ongoing. You just need to create the necessary conditions. As soon as you create these conditions, your emotional and mental planes start to cleanse. Just create these conditions. For us, for me personally, these conditions are my practice. As soon as you concentrate on this axis, you activate these processes and find answers to many questions. During our events and retreats, we devote plenty of time to answering people's questions. During retreats, it can take up to four to five hours. Questions, answers. At the beginning, this is only theory. Theoretically, everybody knows that any question is answerable. You believe in it. But you understand that you need to do something to achieve this. You need to act in any case. When all your questions are answered one by one, you don't need anything else. You don't need to be persuaded, it becomes your reality, your essence. And now we share this practice. You perfectly know it all. Each of you follows your own way to get there. There are various techniques, practices, and so on. Our practice opens the shortest way to our goal, at least for me. The most interesting thing is that I have got plenty of evidence of being on the right track. I don't need to search further. Taking our household as an example, we translate the principle of yoga in the world. Master Jesus once said, be in the world, but not of the world. This process of integration of the spiritual world with this life is the most important. To be in the world, but not of the world, means that we never forget our true nature, we never forget who we really are. But at the same time, we change the world for the better, we transform it. That's why our Kriya practice that we inherited from an immortal Himalayan saint gives us an opportunity of integration of this divine, of everything that is beyond all limits with this world through our consciousness. It's a good tool.
to spiritualize material nature. Therefore, a woman, a girl, Shakti energy, is the Divine Mother. The Divine Mother, either in a little girl or in an adult woman, is the same Divine Mother. She does it perfectly. Even if a girl has no understanding, even if she is not good at anything, even if she, God forbid, smokes or something else, she is still the Divine Mother. Because this is Shakti. If a man understands how to manage this energy and interact with it, first, he will become happy, and second, to increase his power, he will understand how great the power in his possession. Of course, there are men who are aware of the great power they have, but look for another Shakti to increase this power, till they understand that it is all one. But at this level, this man will worship this single principle of Shakti, and he won't need any outward object for it. This is a very high level. With women, it goes the other way around. She worships Shiva. This is an example related to yoga. Say the male principle and the female principle. What does it mean to worship? We interact, we understand, we accept this power, we accept this energy. We channel this energy through ourselves and change our life and the life of our loved ones, and of everybody else we encounter along the way. What do you need to do in order for it to happen? You need to learn to believe in something that does not exist for the sake of having it. It means that we are all saints. Absolutely. All of you sitting here, you're absolutely holy. If you say, I'm just a girl, what can I do? I can't do this. Now I need the whole thing. In saying this, you just cut off opportunities. The universe is here to do anything you ask it for, if it's not beyond the bounds of reason. But sometimes that happens too. The universe is here to do anything that does not violate its laws. You need to believe in it, you need to understand it. If you don't believe in it, you need to understand how it works. Many psychologists talk about it now. They study ancient treatises outlining that every person who has manifested themselves here on Earth is part of the Creator, male or female. Why were we separated? For this aspect of interaction and these energies interacting between themselves, to create more and more new ones. The universe interacts through two energies, yin and yang, plus and minus. The interaction of these energies enables development. Development is not possible if the energy is all the same. If the earth is round, it doesn't evolve. But the earth is not round, nor is it flat. It's an ellipsoid. Yes, yes, you were right. I knew you'd think like this. The Earth is an ellipsoid. An ellipsoid symbolizes a possible expansion or development. And if we underestimate our importance, I'm not speaking about being egoistic, but we need to understand our nature. This is what is important. That's why in Kriya Yoga, we teach the principles that help us realize our true nature in the first place. We start to realize that we are divine beings, not as an ego personality, but as a manifestation. This is obvious. The Creator Himself has manifested in the flesh, in the consciousness, in the soul through vibration. He manifested on His own. It's important to understand it. If you are aware that you are a manifestation of the Creator, that you are part of God, that you are a drop in the world ocean, a drop that carries absolutely all opportunities, your life will be different. What did Jesus say? By the way, Jesus was a Kriya master, in case you don't know. He was taught by Mahavatar Babaji, an immortal Himalayan saint, for about nine to ten years. Before that, he met a great number of wise men. What did he say? What does the Gospel say? It's just an example, I'm not religious. Render unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. It's you who makes the choice. If you are a God-seeker, you will be given tasks, challenges, difficulties intended for a God-seeker. If you are a God who has manifested in a human, then you can accept the opportunities and potential that the universe is ready to give you. 
вы можете принять для себя, и тогда вы можете транслировать. You can transmit all of this. Alter your attitude to yourself, and everything will be all right. Если вы хотите притянуть, скажем, человека, if you want to attract someone who will help you in this life, not the one to marry, God forbid, but the one to be your ally, who will guide you till the end and always stay by your side along the way, then you need to awaken your feminine magnetism. Men should awaken their masculine magnetism, spiritual magnetism, not animal magnetism. None of us suffers from a shortage of animal magnetism, spiritual magnetism. People frequently ask what they should do if one of the partners is a practitioner while the other is not. They want to do good and try to engage the other one into practice. But it's impossible if one doesn't want to. How should one feel about this? What should they do? It's preacher's syndrome, I believe. If someone has swept into a certain system, they genuinely believe that it's very cool and try to engage others. Here the spirit of contradiction comes into play. Looking at such people, one might wonder if they belong to a cult, if they have even escaped from an institution or something. I realize that it's their emotions running high. Rationality is lost at this point. This is why I often say to the practitioners I teach, yes, you are now deep within this practice. You are aware now that you are part of the universe, that you are the creator. You know what you really feel, but calm your mind, calm your emotions. There is no need in doing good in this way. Many married women join us. Just recently we discussed an issue. It happens very often. It's just Jealousy. A man loses attention. His wife is sitting there meditating. And he's doing what? He walks around like he's lost. He can't sit down next to her and practice because his masculine pride doesn't let him do it. She's not here for him. How so? He goes knock, knock, open up. This is it best. Yes. Here jealousy sets in. But if a man and a woman truly love and trust each other, then this will be out of question. It's just because a man wants a woman to serve him, or vice versa, a woman wants a man to constantly give her attention. A husband wants to meditate while she doesn't understand the purpose of it, or vice versa. There is no trust, no understanding. Things evolve in such a way that understanding is unavoidable at some point. It's not always pleasurable, not always positive, because we have karma. There are certain laws that we must always follow. But if you have realized, if you have got awareness of something, karma just disappears. There is no point in punishing a person. By and large, the universe never punishes anyone. If you want to enjoy happiness, you don't have to intentionally resolve your karma. It's impossible. Instead, follow the path of unconditional love for all things, and it will untie all karmic knots. If a person has no understanding, they don't even need it. What they need is to learn to love unconditionally. It will be enough. Since unconditional love is the Creator Himself. When the Creator Himself rules your heart, you don't need to settle anything. Others will love you. They will run after you. They will try to follow you, interact with you just to get your attention, because your magnetism will evolve. It will evolve on its own. It takes skill and practice to keep your energies contained. It is possible. People will cry in your presence. People will laugh in your presence. You will make them happy and attract them. They will constantly try to do something for you for whatever reason. What is this? This is the Holy Spirit. Why does it happen? Because your ego is no longer a priority for you at this point. Absolutely. It was never really a priority. You just live in a state of I am. That is why what is important here is to render unto God the things that are God's. Rendering unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's refers to social life. This is a horizontal plane of communication and so on. Everything that I am telling you now has nothing to do with religion. We practice spirituality. We must understand that for changing our lives, 
For changing things to our benefit, we should follow the principle, love thy neighbor. Who is my neighbor? It's me. I am the closest person to myself. I need to understand myself and to love myself. If I don't love myself, how will I love others? If I have no experience of loving myself, how can I love my child? However, sensual human love is strikingly different from the divine love. Mother's love is a slight, well, not slight, but rather strong, hint of God's infinite, boundless, unconditional love for us. For God loves a criminal, the most villainous scoundrel, no less than he loves a saint. He never discriminates. It is impossible to resolve your karma. Dharma means law, duty, righteousness. It is explained in the Vedas. Following the Dharma path, which means resolving karma, doing what's right, is a proper approach. But you won't be able to break your karmic chains until you do what's most important here. This is a powerful outburst, an emotional, heart-level cry to the universe for help. It's turning to your inner self, speaking to the Creator who is within you. Then he will pull you out, just as Baron Munchausen pulled himself and his horse out of a swamp by his own hair. Do you remember this story? This sounds roughly the same. He says, I grabbed my hair and I just pulled so hard. An example of a man shaping his life, that was his life. 